In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, the title of this uh, sharing with you is Widening, Widening Your Catholic Horizon. Widening. Please take into account that we live in difficult times and it, is, it happens so often that people are narrowing their perspective. Sometimes it seems that everybody is kind of enclosing in their own worlds. We are losing the one world perspective and uh, the race, social class, um, probably origin, country, is becoming divisive and when so many people are narrowing their perspective, it is good for us to think of widening. What would be the way of widening our horizon? That's the initial question tonight. But we speak of widening our Catholic horizon. Probably most of us know what Catholic means. The term Catholic comes from the Greek, kata holos. These two Greek words are joined in the term Catholic. Katha means according to or in some regard, in some perspective. Holos is the term used to mean something that is whole, as you say in English, whole, entire, complete. Kata holos means according to every perspective, or in a shorter version, means universal. But we have to be careful, because this term could be understood in the sense of accepting everything from everybody, and that's not exactly the meaning. Let's go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and we find this. This is number 830. The word Catholic means universal in the sense of according to the totality or in keeping with the whole. The Church is Catholic in a double sense. First, the Church is Catholic because Christ is present in her. Where there is Christ Jesus, there is the Catholic Church. In her subsists the fullness of Christ's body, united with its head. This implies that she receives from him, from Christ himself, the fullness, fullness, the complete, the total, the fullness of the means of salvation. And that's the first meaning, Catholic, meaning receiving and transmitting the fullness of salvation coming from Jesus Christ. Secondly, correct and complete confession of faith, full sacramental life, ordained ministry in apostolic succession, which means that we are invited to go to the ends of the earth and to share with others, with the whole world, the good news of salvation. So Catholic in the sense of having the fullness of salvation and Catholic in the sense of being called to share that fullness of salvation with all the peoples, with all the cultures, men and women, everybody, everywhere, every time. That's the greatness and that's the beauty of the Catholic faith. 
If we think of it, of it, we realize that there is some inner tension in this term. We said that Catholic means according to every perspective, which means that we don't have full grasp of the Catholic faith like uh, a diamond or a, a jewel you have in your hand and you close your fingers and you said, here it is. We don't have the Catholic faith in that sense because the fullness of that salvation has not been expressed already because we haven't reached all the peoples, all the cultures, every aspect of the human life. It is only in contact with new peoples, with new cultures, with new languages even, that we rediscover our faith. So we don't possess the Catholic faith in that sense of closing our hands and saying, now I have it here. That's not the sense of being Catholic. And again, if we are to embrace so much from so many cultures and peoples, how could we do that without simply descending into chaos and confusion? There are many, many different, innumerable cultures and races and peoples, and we rediscover the faith in contact with every new people. You can see that, and say, in Latin America or in Asia, in Africa. When Catholic faith reaches those points, you see that there is a mixture. A beautiful example of Our Lady of Guadalupe. We all know that beautiful apparition of the Blessed Virgin in the 16th century. And the Catholic faith was conquering in a peaceful and loving way, was conquering the Mexican people and many other peoples in Latin America. But at the same time, that Catholicism was in some sense enriched and transformed in contact with this new culture. So can, how can that process happen without descending into chaos and confusion? So we see that there are two, two big challenges that we all have as Catholics. Growth, growth, and at the same time, fidelity. We are called to, to grow, but we are called also to be faithful. And you can make the comparison with the human body, because in some sense, we become a different person, a different body. If you remember your body when you were an infant, when you were a child, it is very different from what you have now. But at the same time, you are the same person. And you can recognize that there has been a process, but along this process, there's something that remains exactly you. Well, it's all the same with the Catholic Church. The Church is growing up and at the same time is called to be faithful to the initial message and faithful to her founder, our Lord Jesus Christ. But you see the tension between growth and fidelity. Sometimes we are so pressed to grow and to reach out for people that probably we are putting at risk the fidelity. Other times we tend to close ourselves and to protect and to build huge walls just to say we are the same as we used to be. But this is also a risk and this is not true faithfulness. So there is tension and this is normal. In human life you experience that particularly during the teenagers. When you are a teen, you remember, or you are going through, you remember that at the same time you were, and you are, and you want to be, and you could be, and you might be, and you will be, and you shall be, 
but you used to be, and all the possible tenses around the, ber the verb to be are kind of flying around you, and this makes you a very difficult person at some time, but then it makes you a wonderful person, a unique person. The kind of tension that you experience is the same tension that the Catholic Church as such is living. And in that, in that sense, the Church is always so experienced and at the same time so young. I remember at the beginning of a beautiful document by John Paul II, Saint John Paul II, Redemptoris Missio is its name in, uh, in um, Latin, uh, John Paul II says, the mission of Christ the Redeemer is at the beginning. 2,000 years after Pentecost, 2,000 years after the great Passover of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are at the beginning. And this is very important, very important. 2,000 years is a lot of time for each one of us individually considered. But 2,000 years is not much time when you think of the church who is always young. So that about the term Catholic, you see the richness of the term. Let's talk a little bit about recent challenges that you and I are facing nowadays. We can say that this is not an easy time for religion. Let's be honest. This is not an easy time for religion. In our time, religion is regarded with a bit of suspicion by many people. And probably you have noted this in college, in university life, in your workplace. Many people feel that affirming that you possess an eternal truth. Wow. So you know the truth. Wow. That's a big word. That you possess eternal truth is far beyond the possibilities of the human mind. And also, they probably accuse you or accuse the believers of this. You are the root of every form of intolerance and violence. So, this is not easy time for religious life. This is not ever easy time for we as believers. In that sense, what is fashionable nowadays is to be agnostic. What does it mean to be agnostic? Gnosis in Greek means knowledge. And to be agnostic is to be someone that is not sure of anything. Well, is there a God? Mm, maybe, I don't know, could be, probably yes, probably not. Um, is the Bible revealed by God? Could be, probably. Well, eventually we settle for a minimum. And that minimum is, well, if that works for you, it's okay. If the Quran works for you, it's okay. If Buddha and Buddhism works for you, that's okay. So we live in a society that is pressing the agenda of agnosticism. And especially young people are experiencing this. Probably, if you are too convinced of something, you begin to notice that your friends are like taking a step away from you because you are becoming a bit intolerant, a bit probably aggressive, violent, I don't know. You are under suspicion. You are under scrutiny. Strong commitment is almost dangerous. It's seen as almost dangerous nowadays. For many people, it's not uncommon that young adults see strong beliefs as belonging to a less educated people. Well, probably grandma. Well, you know, grandma. What could expect? From grandma, her rosary, her devotions, her blessed sacrament. Well, 
she didn't have the opportunity of being a really educated person. But now I am a truly educated person. I have gone to the university. I know better. So, well, you have to be very understanding with grandma and grandpa. But we know better. And that's the attitude that many people are taking nowadays. In the sense that, well, less educated people could be faithful and have a strong commitment to their faith. But as for us, well, we are modern people, we are agnostics, and we are, have a very, 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 very open mind. As our mind is so open, we don't, we don't um, pledge any strong alliance with anything. A different but related issue is the fact that even within the church, we find tension between so-called conservatives and so-called progressives. The former, the conservatives, are very sensitive to the truth of the church, the truth of the church, and the purity of the deposit of faith, and the perfect celebration of the liturgy. While the latter, the progressives, are more sensitive to the work of the gospel in the world and outreaching and evangelization and all that. So you see also that tension within the church. And probably between conservatives and progressives, there are millions of believers perplexed. And you can be one of those. Perplexed. Because they just wonder whether they can simply be Catholics. Probably you are just happy with being a Catholic. You don't like additional tags. I'm just a Catholic. I don't like the tag of being traditionalist, progressive, or whatever. I'm just, I just belong to Christ. I'm, I'm so grateful to him, and I don't need any additional tag. This kind of tension in a country like this beautiful country is visible even from diocese to diocese. And we all know that something should be done, but nobody is completely sure what could be done to really improve the situation of our beloved Catholic Church. So let's talk about fixing the church. Now we are to fix the church. What do we do? We have to fix the church because this kind of tension and we need a better um, public relations department with the world. So how can we fix the church? It should be simple. We all go, we all go back to Jesus Christ. Problem solved. We pay real attention to his words and example. We receive him as our Lord and Master. And everything else should follow seamlessly. What's the problem? We all go back to Jesus. And Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Master. So if you obey Christ Jesus, I obey Christ Jesus, what kind of division might be between you and me? No problem. Well, sorry, it doesn't work that way. What's the problem? We don't have direct access to Jesus above and beyond the church. This is a very important statement. May I repeat myself? We don't have direct access to Jesus above and beyond the church. There was a man in the 16th century, at the beginning of the 16th century, in the 1500s. His name was Luther. And Luther thought it could be done. He thought that he could bypass the church. I don't need the church. I have the Bible, it's the word of God. I have my conscience, I have prayer, I can invoke the grace of the Holy Spirit, so I don't need the church. What I need is the word of God, and I already have it because I have the Holy Scripture. That's everything I need, problem solved. So Luther, Luther thought that he could bypass the church. I don't need the church. In fact, when the church, represented at that time by cardinals, theologians, 
Pope Lee Gates and very important people, Luther was dismissive and almost despiteful about this, this kind of people. And, and, and he said, I have the Bible and I have my conscience. I don't need you, church. Well, did it work for him? Did it work for his followers? Let's see a little closer what happened. The problem is that the meaning of what you read, when you take, for example, the Holy Bible, the meaning of what you read is mediated. Look at that word, mediated, by the meaning of the terms you read. And those terms acquire their significance only when considered in the lives of real human beings. So, you take the Bible, that's okay. There are some words in the Bible like sin, salvation, redemption, grace, pardon, justification. Good. Okay, it's good. But how can we understand that meaning? How can we make those words our own? How can we see, how can we understand really what is salvation, for example? And that's part of what is going on nowadays. If you stop somebody on the street and you say, are you saved? Probably the person would stare with a blank face and say, don't get what you are saying. I'm rushing to my work. Bye. End of the story. So, in order to grasp what sin is, what salvation is, what redemption is, what holiness is, what grace is, you need somebody that is giving meaning to that word. For example, if you see a person with a bright and smiling and really happy face and he's telling you, I, I met Jesus Christ. You met, you met whom? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has changed my life. This very morning I was praying and I felt the presence of the Lord. Well, somebody is telling you what happened to him or to her. And that person is giving meaning to the word salvation or redemption or sin or whatever. So in order to understand the very words of the scripture, we need people. We need community. You cannot simply enclose yourself in your room and say, now I understand everything. No. The meaning of the words come from the lives of real communities, of real people. That's the origin of the meaning. So every time that we try to bypass the church, every time that we can, we think we can to bypass the church, we are just with the memory of what the church already sown in our minds. And that was exactly what happened with Luther. The meaning of the words that make you able to understand the Holy Scripture, that meaning of the words come from community. In fact, there was a time when there was church and there was no Bible. That's true. The Lord Jesus Christ was risen, say, by the year 30 or 35 of our era. And then, when was the first gospel put in written? Well, might be 30 years after that. We didn't have the fullness of the scripture of the Holy Bible before the end of the first century. And we, as Christians, we needed a couple of centuries more just to establish the canon of the Bible. So it was the church that was transmitting salvation, was transmitting redemption, was transmitting the meaning of the words that then were fixed, established in the Holy Scripture. So you cannot bypass the church. But this is a big problem. This is a big problem because we were to fix the church. If we are to fix the church and we cannot bypass the church, how can you solve that? 
I was thinking of fixing the world, <laughs> as, my, as our uh, Jorge was telling us. How can we fix the church if we cannot bypass the church? There's no direct access. Well, that is, that is in the sense that every time that you are invoking the name of the Lord, okay, of course Jesus can be present in your life by the, by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes, it's true. But the important thing is that you realize that every time that you are praying, you are using words that had sense, has, have sense only because they belong to a community of believers. So again, even when you are alone in the desert, in the most perfect loneliness, Calling the Lord, come to me. At that time, you are not alone. Because the meaning of all that comes from the community of believers where you got the sense of the Holy Scripture. So in order to be real Christians and in order to improve the situation of the church, we need the church. This very church with sinners like me and probably like you. We need the church. To fix the church, we need the church. To improve the church, we need the church. So it is not inventing a different church. It is not changing the message. It's not bypassing the church. Well, time to approach a different road. We read in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, Verse 1 and, and the next. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, the beauty of this text is that obviously we have to go to Jesus, but not avoiding the community, not avoiding our brothers and sisters, but with our brothers and sisters, and in some sense, through the experience of all of them. That's the beautiful of all this. The communion of saints, my friends, the communion of saints is far more than beautiful memories. It is only through the testimony of all these men and women that we can get closer and closer to Jesus. Because it is not the invented Jesus. It is not the imagined Jesus who will save me. It is the real Jesus who is credited by the beauty of his works in all those saints, men and women. So what we are proposing is we need the cloud of witnesses. This comes from the chapter 12 of the letter to the Hebrews. Cloud of witnesses. And cloud of witnesses, what is? Cloud of witnesses is, well, we live in the time of the cloud. Everybody is speaking of the cloud. Oh, I have that file in the cloud. You can get it from the cloud. Well, we live in the cloud, and we need the cloud, but a different kind of cloud. The cloud that we need is the cloud of witnesses. It is so interesting that in chapter 20, of the prophet Jeremiah, we, we hear the prophet really crying out. The word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. Can you imagine that? A fire shoot up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear 
Many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him, let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he will be deceived. So you see that the experience of the prophet Jeremiah is being surrounded by deception and um, all kind of evil. And he says, in his despair, he says, terror on every side. And probably that's what so many Catholics are experiencing right now. So many Catholics feel this, that where can I be a Catholic 24 hours, 7 days a week? Many Catholics are hiding their faith. So if you are in the group, in the parish, in your community, well, you are Catholic and you go to communion and you confess your sins, and probably you know a couple of hymns and you sing very beautiful the praises of the Lord. Great. But then, when you are in your workplace and nobody else is a Catholic, nobody else is a Christian, and they are all in the fashionable agnosticism of nowadays, probably you feel what the prophet is saying. You feel that you cannot trust almost anybody. You cannot trust anybody in the sense of, I don't know if I am putting myself in ridicule if even my best friend will mock at me because of my faith. So probably you feel surrounded by this experience of terror on every side. But then the prophet, the message of the prophet has to be completed with the letter of, to the Hebrews, chapter 12. If you feel sometimes that you are surrounded by terror on every side, what you need is the cloud of witnesses. I don't know if I can make myself clear. You are surrounded by suspicion, uh, by unbelief, by mockery. You are surrounded by all that. The only solution, the only way out is that you also, also feel surrounded by, surrounded by the cloud of witnesses. Well, the cloud of witnesses, of course, is the many, many saints that we have from all walks of life. This very year, 100 years after Fatima, we have the canonization of Jacinta and Francisco, two children, two saints, two children, saints. That's great. But from every walk of life, we can take example. And that's part of the cloud of witnesses. But I would like to, to finish this shading, this talk. I would like to shading not only the experience of people that lived 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, or centuries ago. May I finish mentioning people that right now, right now, are witnessing to Jesus Christ, right now. If you are a Catholic, and I'm sure most of you, probably all of you, are Catholics. If you are a Catholic, you belong to the same spiritual community of Father Tom and Sister Gloria Cecilia. May I introduce Sister Gloria Cecilia? Who is she? Well, this news come comes from the Catholic News Agency. I have a picture of her over there. Um, the CNA, the Catholic News Agency, brings this news. This comes from a few months ago, 2017. The cloud of witnesses, people like this. The Colombian bishops, this is the news. The Colombian bishops are asking for prayers after a religious sister from Colombia was kidnapped for the home where she served in Mali. Sister Gloria Cecilia Narvaez, a member of the Franciscan Sisters of Mary Immaculate, was abducted by armed men Tuesday night, according to officials. The men forced Sister Cecilia to hand over the keys to the community's ambulance according to the superior, Sister Noemi Quesada. The vehicle 
was later found abandoned. While all four of the sisters who live in the house in Carangasso, Carangasso is the place where uh, she lived and was kidnapped. While all four of the sisters were present at the time of the intrusion, the other three managed to escape. So far, no one has taken responsibility for the kidnapping. And what is the present situation? We are now in October. Sister Quesada said, Sister Quesada is the superior of that house, said the kidnappers claim to be jihadists. However, Father Edmond de Bele, Secretary General of the Malian Bishops' Conference, acknowledged the possibility that the kidnapping was carried out by, the bandit, by bandits who claimed to be jihadists to mislead investigators. This hypothesis is supported by the fact that the culprits stole the sisters' computers, money, and car. The end of this brief news is we don't know who kidnapped her. The civil guard and the police are investigating. The bishops are also moving to obtain information in the area. Well, why? Why is this lady in Mali because she is witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. She is a witness to the gospel. So there are people that are doing their best to witness to Jesus Christ. And this is an example. And then she was kidnapped. We don't know at this time at the time of this recording, we don't know about the whereabouts or what is going on. But this is not the only case. I brought her as an example of many people that are working in very, very difficult situation. It is far more known another religious sister, Guadalupe is her name, he's from Argentina, and he has spent many years working in Syria. Syria. You can, you can see, you can watch testimony of her work. Bombs, explosion, murder, every sort of difficulty. And this Argentinian woman stays over there. She only, she only goes from Syria just to tell other people what's going on in Syria. To bring help and solidarity to the people of Syria. So think of that. Think of that, please. What is she doing? She's bearing witness to Jesus Christ and to the gospel. So... Sister Gloria Cecilia, Sister Guadalupe, and many, many other people, lay people, men, women, children, they are celebrating their faith even if that includes the possibility of dying. Recently, I remember the, the moving testimony of a mother in Nigeria. There are some regions in Nigeria that are very difficult to be a Christian. Probably some of you know and this young mother said to the cameras, when we go to Mass every Sunday, we don't know if we will be able to go back home. We don't know. Probably this is the Sunday we are to die. Think of that, please. What entails for you going to Mass? What's the implication of you going to Mass? This day, tomorrow, next Monday, next Sunday, or whatever. And think of what implies to go to Mass if you are in that part of Nigeria. That's part of the cloud of witnesses. And when we get closer to this mother in Nigeria, to Sister Gloria Cecilia in Mali, to Sister Guadalupe in Syria, when we get closer to that people, we really get closer to Jesus Christ. So they are telling us 
What's the essence and the joy and the power and the beauty of the gospel? This is the persecuted church. And they are teaching us all what it entails to be a Christian and to be a Catholic. My second example is happier, thanks be to God, because at this time I, remember, I remind you, we don't know what's going on with Sister Gloria Cecilia. We are praying for her, especially because, well, I don't want to be mean, but the situation is that you see that everybody that is involved in this crime is men and men and men, and this is a woman. So we are really, really fearing for her life and her integrity. We have to pray for her. Next example is Father Tom Ushunalil. Ushunalil. Probably I am mispronouncing the name. Tom Ushunalil. He is from India. Again, the same Catholic news agency brings news. This is a photo. He was kidnapped as well. And uh, this is very dramatic because when he was kidnapped, that was the same occasion when many sisters from the community of Mother Teresa were killed. He was with the sisters. Thanks be to God, we have to say, his life was spared and now he's, um, he's alive and, and he's back to India. Let's read a little bit about the news and then we will, we will try to gather some lessons that help us to live our Catholic faith in a more meaningful and more powerful way. <clears throat> After more than 18, 18 months, 18 months, he was liberated like a month ago or something like that. So 18 months means February, January last year. Can you imagine one year and a half in the hands of your captors, of people that have kidnapped you? Well, that is what Father Tom went through. After more than 18 months of questions and uncertainty regarding the fate of, Tom, of Father Tom Ushu Nalil, following his abduction by militants in Yemen, the priest has finally been set free and is on his way home to India. The news was officially announced by Indian Foreign Minister Sujma Swarach in a September 12 tweet that read, I am happy to inform that Father Tom has been rescued. Father Tom, why was Father Tom in Yemen? Why was he there? Business? Making money? Becoming himself famous? No. Father Tom is a Salesian missionary first garnered the world's attention when he was kidnapped March, March the 4th, 2016, during an attack on a missionaries of charity home in Aden, Yemen. In that attack, 16 people were killed, including four sisters of charity. They are martyrs. This is 2016. This is a year ago. That's what I say that <clears throat> we are surrounded. Surrounded. This is the cloud. If sometimes you feel that you are surrounded by fear, surrounded by shame, surrounded by, I don't know, what's attacking your faith, please remember, you are also surrounded by the cloud of witnesses. People like Father Tom. This is a picture, as I told you, this is a picture that was spread around when he was in his uh, period of kidnapping. And at that time, he was begging for his life. He was asking the minister of India to help him out. He was asking the Catholic Church. He was asking the Muslim authorities to respect her li his life. So th th that's, that's the moment he's doing that. His international profile grew when rumors spread that he was to be crucified. He was to be crucified on Good Friday, 2017. 
This didn't happen, of course. But this has happened to some Christians. One of the forms that some Christians are giving away, giving their lives, is exactly repeating the sacrifice of Christ because they are, as a way of mockery and cruelty, they are crucified like our Lord. So there, was, there were rumors that he was to be crucified on Good Friday, but then it didn't happen. Since then, numerous photos and videos have been released, picturing Father Tom, thin and with an overgrown beard, pleading for help and for his release. In a statement, well, according to the state-run Oman News Agency, Father Tom's release was secured by Oman, and he has already arrived in the Omani capital of Muscat. Uh, probably you have seen great pictures of Father Tom with Pope Francis. It's it's, it's so, so warming. It, for me, it's very moving that. Because uh, when this father went to the Pope, first thing that he did was kneeling before the Pope and kissing the feet of the Pope. And then the Pope helped him to stand up and then kissed her hands, his hands, the hands of a true witness of Christ. Father Tom has been transferred to Moscat. This is in Oman, from where he will return to his home in Kerala. Kerala is India. Witness. Witness. This is the people that can tell us what to be a Catholic is all about. This is the people that can tell us that. Conclusion. Some lessons we can gather to live a more a beautiful and flourishing and, and fruitful Catholic life. The summary is, as soon as we approach the persecuted church, our perspective on all things Catholic changes. What can really make a difference in your Catholic life is, please, Make a step towards the persecuted church. They are the true witnesses. And I explain myself. When you approach, when you get near the persecuted church, liturgy and sacraments are much more than rituals. Think of martyrs from old age or from recent time. Think of martyrs receiving not their first communion, but their last communion. There are great stories, there are great stories of those martyrs in ancient Rome when they were about to be sacrificed. For example, in the Colosseum in Rome. And sometimes, they have kept very, very carefully, they have kept the Eucharist just for that moment. They were at the brink of being sacrificed, at the brink of offering their lives in full imitation of Jesus Christ. Think of that moment, taking the Eucharist and receiving the Holy Communion. What that communion means at that time. Well, I hope that we, in our regular masses, in our regular retreats, spiritual retreats, are also able to receive the Lord with some, with some part of that love, with some of that love, can you imagine that moment taking the body of Christ and knowing, knowing very well, this is not my first communion. This is my last communion. I will not be able to receive Holy Communion in this life. From here to heaven. That's really impressive. So liturgy and sacraments acquire 
take a different colors, um, color and bright, brightness when you see the persecuted church. Dogma, the deposit of faith. Well, a distinguished professor may discuss for decades the meaning of the resurrection. Sometimes in the faculties of theology, I teach in a faculty of theology in Bogota. Sometimes in the faculties of theology there are long discussions, theories and theories, theories upon theories about the resurrection and about the miracles and about all that. Well, you know Father Hamel? Father Hamel was an ancient priest, 80 years old or something like that, that was beheaded in France a year ago, a little more. He was celebrating the Mass, and he was attacked, and then uh, he was secluded in the sacristy, and eventually he was beheaded. That was the situation of him. Well, think of Father Hamel. Hamel is his name with H. Father Hamel. And I insist in the names because probably you will like to check these names and to see more information about these great witnesses. Think of Father Hamel knowing this was my last Mass. This was my last Mass. My life is over and I am about to die. Well, what resurrection means in those circumstances? This is not about discussing theories and what do you think, what do you think? No, it's about you dying. Do you believe? in the resurrection of the Lord. Here and now, do you believe in that? Yes or not? That's the question. So when we approach the persecuted church, we really, really change our perspective in dogma as well. And then, when everything in our life is firm and secure, we may wonder how much we can enjoy ourselves and still be called Catholics. From time to time I receive this kind of question. Can I be a Catholic and go to a party? Of course you can. Well, be careful, but you can. Can I go to a party tonight? Well, yes. And tomorrow? Also tomorrow, yes, I received an invitation for tomorrow. Well, yes. And can I go also to a different party the day after tomorrow? And then can I go to vacations and then can I enjoy myself? When everything is in place and you feel that you are completely secure, probably the one concern that you have is how can I enjoy a little more my life. But when you approach these witnesses, your perspective changes. When everything you know is under attack, you see that sacrifice makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. And you see that saying, sometimes saying yourself a big no is also sensible and it's also good. So, in great summary, and in, in big summary, I can say that we need the cloud of witnesses. We need these people. We have to be reminded from time to time who are the ones, men and women, that are really, really close to the Lord. Because they are the exegesis, the living exegesis of the Bible. They are the ones that are able to make meaningful the words of the scripture and to fix the church. We have to get closer to them, to learn from them, and I am sure through them we will be able to rediscover our faith. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit.